Well, let me welcome all of you. Uh, this is the Future Transform. This is the fourth in a series of meetings where we take a look at the present of education and technology in order to better understand the future. I'm your host, Chief Tormentor, Cat Herder, and presenter, Brian Alexander, uh, speaking to you from sunny Vermont, where it is now, I think, 12 or 13 degrees. So Future Transform is a weekly event. This is where we get together with one expert or visionary or leading practitioner in the intersection of technology and education. We look carefully at present trends in order to get a better handle on what's happening over the medium to long-term future. And we look at education in context, we look at technology, we look at K-12, uh, with emphasis on the United States, but with an eye towards the entire world. We meet this every week. Every week we proceed the event with a blog post on my blog to introduce the new guest. And we follow this up by putting the recording of a full hour on YouTube along with my notes and my blog for free so everyone can join in. Next slide, please. Uh, this comes out of my Future Trends in Technology and Education project. This has been going on now for years where I've been doing an environmental scan and every month take a look at current trend lines in order to project them forward and see what's going to have the biggest influence. In fact, we'll be talking a lot about that in just next week. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to thank one of our sponsors, NizerNet from New York State. They have been generously sponsoring FTDE. and very, very glad to work. Next slide, please. And we're also especially grateful to Shindig. Uh, the hardworking team and the hardworking technology makes all of this possible. They're using the really neat platform right now. And in fact, let me just take a minute to say a few words about how this works. What you're looking at is the Shindig environment on your screen. At the very top part of the screen where I am and right next to me are two spotlights. That's the stage. This is where the events really take place. So this is where one or two people will be, sometimes presentation materials. Think of this as the stage in an auditorium or the podium of a classroom. Now on the bottom of the screen, you can see all these individual icons. And sometimes they are a video feed or a photograph or a stereotypical picture. And each one of those represents one person or one connection somewhere in the world participating here. You can mouse over each one of them and get a little bit more information about them. And in fact, if you're not on stage like I am, you can click on a person, the two of your icons will click together and you can chat at each other. Speaking of chat, if you can't see the chat room that's going on right now, mouse over your own icon and you'll see a few different boxes. One of them says, I am chat. Click that and you'll see the chat room. It's actually chat rooms. There's one for everybody here, which I'm typing in now. And you get a chat room for every person here. So you can privately chat to Mary Crawford, to, to Mark Babbitt, or myself. Also, the bottom part of the screen, over on your bottom right, are two orange buttons. One of them is a palm raised up like this, and one of them just says the word ask. The raised palm is if you have a question or a comment. And this is awesome, because if you raise that and we acknowledge you, then we boot one of us off the stage and bring you up so you get to talk with us until you're done, which is great. If you want to ask a question, click the ask, and that will just let you type in a question. It's kind of like the chat box if it's promoted and we can all see it much more clearly. Meanwhile, if you're on Twitter, please feel free to tweet uh, your responses or comments. Here's the hashtag. And I am there um, as Brian Alexander. So just be sure to tweet at me or include the hashtag and we can keep this conversation going. Next slide, please. Now, today's guest is a friend of mine who I've known since, I think, the early 21st century. Will Richardson, who is very, very well known as a secondary school teacher, I believe, from New Jersey. Uh, he is a first-generation edu blogger, one of the first people who started blogging in education. Not just blogging about education, but having students blog, thinking hard about blogging, pushing the novel as to where it could go. One of the first groundbreakers in that field. He's also become since a writer, a consultant, a speaker, and an editor. And in full disclosure, I published a book under his editorship. You can see those three links will take to reading the different projects, including his homepage, his Twitter feed, and his modern learner site. He's going to be our chief guest and victim today. You can find more from these links there. So, unless we have any further slides in preparation, without further ado, Shindig can bring Will up to the front.
Hey, Brian, how are you? How are you? Great, Will. How are you doing now? I'm doing great. You know, I think I was trying to remember, but I think the first time we met was at Middlebury, wasn't it? Uh, a long time ago. It's um, correct. Yeah, it was correct. Yeah, it was over 10, 12 yeah. years ago now. That was a long time. Anyway, thanks for having me today. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. That was the first Bush administration, I think. Other than that, it was a pleasure. <laughs> um, so just as a meta note for everyone, you can see the two of us up here at the top, and we're going to be talking. Imagine us sitting in lounge chairs with pina coladas under a bright sun. That's what we were thinking of this out with um, So what we'll do is we're going to, I'm going to toss questions at Will's way, and he's going to answer them. We'll go back and forth. And as we go, you will doubtless have questions, comments, pushbacks, observations, howls, and outrage. And again, you can signify those through a few different ways. You can go to Twitter and tweet them out. You can enter them in the chat box so we can all see them like this. Or again, you could raise your hand by pressing that button or clicking the ask button. And after about half an hour or so, uh, we'll stop going back and forth with each other and we'll throw the floor open to see whoever else has comments or questions. So if you have one, you don't want to interrupt, that's fine. Hold on to it. We'll come back to you. Now, uh, Will, uh, I just want to begin by throwing you back to your K-12 roots and ask you, in 2016, what are some of the major trends that you see in K-12 that you think are might have a transformative impact over the next five to ten years? Well, you know, I wish I had a better answer for that question, Brian. I think in many ways... Uh, when I look back, it's been it's going to be ten years in a couple months that I left my uh, my school job, and um, in my travels around to other schools right now, uh, I really don't see a lot that's changed. So you know, I don't see too many trend lines that suggest that we're rethinking what happens in schools. I think obviously there's lots more technology. Um, we've seen an explosion of iPads and Chromebooks and and whatever else. Um, but I think the irony of this moment, to be honest with you, is that the trend lines that I see, at least the ones that are interesting to me, are really retro. I mean, they, they go back almost 100 years um, and they they start around the idea that, you know, kids need to learn in different ways or kids do learn in different ways from the ways that schools are structured. And, um, you know, we're talking about Dewey and Montessori and Papert and all those people, Saracen, who I quote a lot, you know, who for decades have been writing about the fact that um, learning is is the way that we learn outside of school doesn't look much like the way that we learn, quote unquote, inside of school. So, I mean, it, it, maybe it's wishful thinking, but um, I actually feel like one of the trends is that we really are now beginning to take a look back at what we kind of inherently know about how learning works and using that as the lens for looking at our practice in schools. Um, I happen to have been on another webinar this morning uh, with a group in Ottawa uh, with Michael Fullen and Alec Kuros and Sylvia Martinez and a number of other people. And they were really talking about those same things. And what I found really interesting was that there was one woman on, on one of the panels who said, uh, who, who said basically that she was almost shocked that um, such a big district, this was the, uh, the French speaking Catholic district up in Ottawa, um, that such a big yeah. district had really articulated a vision that focused on giving kids agency over their learning um, and that uh you know why is that shocking <laughs> you know and i think that was the reaction from a number of people you know we we know this this isn't you know i say this all the time it's not rocket science we know how kids learn we know how we learn and we know that that doesn't match with what we do in school so i'm hoping that the trend line is that we are finally becoming a little bit more um, focused on the learning piece of it and not so much the teaching and education piece of it. Um, and I know that, you know, that's an interesting in, in, in the uh, arena that you spend most of your time, you know, in higher ed. And I think that that's, uh, that obviously has implications and it obviously um, informs that. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see a lot in terms of, you know, really transformative technologies or anything like that, but I am seeing many, many conversations now that are going back to the, the kind of fundamental ideas about learning, which I think is a very good thing, but I think it's also a, 
a very difficult conversation for a lot of schools, a lot of teachers, a lot of parents, all that kind of stuff. Very challenging, very challenging. Uh, Will, this is a great opening gambit. Let me let me just um, pull apart a couple of these different lines. I think they're, they're fascinating. I mean, one, when you see that not much is changing in terms of how schools operate, I mean, that is a vitally important trend line. Um, you know, the stasis, something unchanging, or in political science terms, continuity, is, is vitally important. Uh, it means that it will keep on going. Uh, you know, you can see this in uh, the technology world, where we had email. That just keeps on going. No one wants to talk about it, but it's still, it's still there. It's still important. So I think that's an important datum for anyone in post-secondary to think about. Um, but in a second, your, your point about going back in time, going back a century, thinking about Montessori, the Papert, I would add uh, Vygotsky. Um, yeah. Do you see people combining that knowledge along with recent developments in neuroscience, or are these basically two different boxes? Well, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm the most qualified to speak to, to that. I mean, I think that, you know, uh, certainly a lot of the brain science is, again, uh, is showing things that I'm, I'm, I think we basically knew. And that is, you know, that um, kids really need certain conditions to learn deeply, that we all need certain conditions to learn deeply. Um, and that in some ways, technology can certainly stimulate that and amplify that, which I think is, is the promise of technology, actually. It, it is that ability to, um, to see things in a different way, to create things in different ways, to solve problems in different ways. And um, that, that can be a, a highly stimulating and a highly engaging way of doing it. Um, you know, but I, I think that, that uh, you know, I'll go back to it and I'll, I'll say again that, um, the learning piece of it isn't changing. And, and that's why I, you know, I get so frustrated and depressed sometimes when I'm walking around on vendor floors uh, at big conferences with all these people who are selling technologies as ways to engage kids more, as ways to you know, motivate them more. It's not the technology that engages them or motivates them. It's the, it's the ideas. It's the things that they want to learn. It's the questions that they have. Um, and, um, I just don't see yet, uh, at scale at least, you know, schools uh, embracing that idea. Um, like I said, some are, others aren't. But um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's going to take some time. I remember Justin. I remember there was an Edge. dot uh, org. I think it is a uh, question a couple of years ago about. I think actually, I think you were maybe even a part of that, um, where they asked, uh, you know, what do you see schools like in 10 years? How is education going to change? And I remember the one I remember most was Justin Reichs, actually, from Harvard, who said schools won't change at all in 10 years. <laughs> They're pretty much going to be the same things that they are today because, you know, the structures are just so difficult to move and the expectations are so entrenched. Um, so. I, you know, I do. I, I think the way I kind of put it is learning is leaving the building. So the trend line for learning, I think, is really exciting and uh, for personal learning and, and, uh, and you know, our ability to learn on our own. It's really exciting. And I think the opportunities for that are great. But um, schools aren't really about that. You know, schools are about a very different way of thinking about it. And uh, so, yeah, we'll see how that goes. I want to I want to put that on hold for a second. So that's a very powerful phrase that learning is leaving the building. I want to come, I want to, come to that. But let me just back up a little bit. Um, what do you think is, what do you think is happening with the explosion of devices? I mean, you mentioned iPads and Chromebooks, and it's possible that we're seeing Chromebooks really take off in the secondary market. Um, if we also think about, uh, say, smart boards, whiteboards, that kind of thing. What's happening with these devices? Are they being ignored or are they being used to capitulate traditional uh, pedagogies? Yeah, uh, really nothing changes uh, very much um, when kids get these devices. Um, most of the places that I go, first of all, most of the places, most of the schools that I visit and a lot of schools that I'm working with, they, they don't have a clear vision for buying the technology in the first place. Um, they're, they're basically, when I ask them, you know, well, why did you buy this particular device? Well, I get lots of different answers like, well, we had to upgrade our technology or because parents expect it or because the school down the road, you know, we're competing and we've got we've got to have, to have more technology. But it's not there's no real vision around learning or lens of learning through which they kind of make the decision about the devices that they buy or the pedagogies that they use or anything like that. So 
you know, Google, Google, uh, um, Google Classroom and, and all the Google tools, great stuff, but kids are handing in their homework, you know, um, and uh, teachers are basically disseminating PowerPoints. And it, the, the uses of those particular tools are still very, very teacher centric, especially with whiteboards. Um, and uh, so uh, they're either used, they're either kind of co-opted into traditional roles uh, or they're not used at all. Um, there are lots of places that have now, you know, dozens of very expensive smart boards tucked away in a closet somewhere because um, there really hasn't been an understanding of, of how to use them, why to use them, various reasons, right? But um, very rarely do you go into a school and you see technology in the hands of kids that is uh, really being used to give more agency over learning to that child, which is the way that kids use technology outside of school, right? <laughs> a kid has a device. And, you know, I think the Los Angeles story is perfect with the iPads, you know, giving out, um, they were going to give an iPad to every child. And uh, the first rollout within days, kids were fixing the iPads <laughs> because they couldn't do anything with the iPads. And so that's when the district took them back and said, well, that's not what you were supposed to do with those. You were supposed to read Pearson digital textbooks and take the state assessments. That's it. You know, uh, what do you mean you wanted to get on Facebook and use, you know, Rhapsody or whatever other tools that they were using? So we don't have a vision for it. We don't understand what happens when we give kids technology that they would use in different ways outside of school, that we have to build that capacity but, but you to do that stuff in school. But, but you have that vision. I mean, you have, you have this phrase, this resonant phrase. I want to make sure that everyone hears it again, that the learning is leaving the building and also in right. the school building. Um, the schools yeah. aren't really about learning that yeah. way. And, and one difference is that the minute you leave the building, physically or mentally, uh, the students have more agency. Can, can you expand a bit more on uh, what kind of learning is happening outside the building? Well, I think, you know, I, I said this in my last TED Talk, too. I mean, the, the point of it was is that schools weren't built for learning. They really weren't. I mean, when you think about um, how we all, all learn on our own now or outside of school, um, again, it comes back to what questions are we asking and um, what work are we doing in the world? What problems are we solving? How are we connecting to other people to either cooperate with them or collaborate with them? Um, how are we learning from one another? All of those types of things that we really have control over, that we have agency over. I, 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 I don't know about you, Brian, but I would find it really difficult right now to all of a sudden be put in an environment where I'm being told what to learn, when to learn it, how to learn it, and how I'm going to be assessed on it. That, that kind of structure makes absolutely no sense to me any longer. So I think all of us are learners. I think kids are especially are learners. And, you know, I look at my own two teenagers and, um, you know, they're kind of my, my reach, right? And they're learning about all sorts of stuff that they really care about, um, using their technologies, using their connections, using their access. And we all do the same thing. There's not a person in this room. Huh? How old are the kids now? The kids, how old, are, how old are they? They're 16 and 18. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, you know, they're, they're fully immersed in that stuff. And look, my kids are privileged. I get it. You know, they have a, a lot of access and, and uh, you know, they hopefully have used, uh, learned to use it well, uh, not so much uh, because of their schools, but more because of our conversations at home. But but look, you know, there's not a person in this room and there's not a, hardly a person anywhere on the web that hasn't gone to YouTube and typed in a search that says, how do I, right, how do I change the muffler? How do I cook Italian pasta? You know, whatever. So that kind of on-demand learning, that, that potential that we have is then silenced when kids come into school and it becomes someone else's learning, someone else's questions, someone else's stuff. Um, and my kids are, um, we're in our board. You know, by that whole kind of uh, structure now. Uh, I hear you. I hear you. Um, just this uh, this past month, to write about this, uh, I started learning a new foreign language, and uh, in order to do that, uh, I relied on two sources: primarily a set of web pages, websites, really, and also the mobile app Duolingo. And I've been making a lot of progress. I've been doing this partly because it's a language I've always wanted to learn, and partly because I wanted to teach my two kids, because they're learning this language, and I wanted to help them, and uh, so I'm trying to catch up to where they are. And uh, I, I'm feeling no desire to have a PowerPoint presentation on this. I'm feeling no desire to sit in a, 
I'm shocked. I'm shocked. It's weird. I, I tell you, it gives me the sense that I can imagine a 10th grader um, having a half day of no classes, but just let's say a homeroom or a library. Um, and it's them and something like Duolingo, you know, whatever whatever tool they're using. If they're learning diesel mechanics, if they're learning video editing, if they're learning a smart movie, um, you know, it's, it's them with a chunk of time and say enough bandwidth, enough electricity and all that to be able to explore. Um, and that's one vision I had. But, but let me ask you though, I mean, I mean, thinking about, thinking about this kind of, this renaissance of learning that's going on outside of schools, what can, how can this inform what's going on in post-secondary education? What should college and university leaders take away from that? Well, I, I think in answer to that, the most interesting thing that I've read was when Stanford did, I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I think it might have been 2099, or they did some type of future um, forward uh -huh. thinking about what they wanted the school to be like, or maybe it was 2025 or something like that. But one of them, they came up with four scenarios. And one of them was really interesting to me where they said, you know, instead of having majors, let's have missions. Um, and I thought that's really interesting, right? Because it's an acknowledgement that again, it's not so much the content knowledge that you accrue through school, through the you know experiences that you have in school, but it's actually the application of that stuff into doing real world in the work, solving real problems in the world. And one of the examples they had was, you know, instead of uh, being a science major, uh, my mission is to solve world hunger, you know, um, and to me that's just a very interesting important shift um, around uh, again uh, giving giving respect and agency to kids to learn about the things that they want to learn while at the same time um, getting the knowledge that they need to solve the problems that that they want to solve and that's you know that's kind of our role too so on the larger scale i think for both higher ed and for um, k through 12 I think, you know, I love this phrase, I, I'm, I'm stealing it from my friend Bruce Dixon, but I love the phrase that curriculum becomes strategy, right? That curriculum is something that, that we have, but we take it as teachers and as mentors and help kids apply it in the moment that they need it, rather than to say, okay, today everyone's going to learn the Pythagorean theorem or everyone's going to learn this particular piece of the, you know, the, of, the, of information. Um, regardless of whether or not you have any intention, need at any point in your life to apply it, right? Instead, well, what is the question that you're asking right now? What is the problem you're trying to solve? Oh, here, here's this piece of curriculum that, that let's learn this now when it's relevant to you. And I think that that's, you know, that's going to be, that's what we do outside of school, right? I mean, again, um, when I need to learn something, whether it's, it's uh, code or, you know, if I'm trying to, trying to create a web page, I'm working on my new website, so if I'm running into some problems with the with the code or whatever, I'll learn that code in the moment. I'll go out and find that and research it and get that answer in the moment, rather than having to rely on the HTML textbook that I read five years ago, where I got 100 on the test, but there's no way I recall that information now and can apply it. So right. that's what I'm that's what I'm kind of talking about, right? We we in, in our own lives as learners outside of school use the curriculum of the web as strategy. We pull as needed. We we don't necessarily take, you know, um, all of it and try to memorize it and then you know try to apply it. Well, this is you're you're reminding me of a, of a really entertaining book. Um, let's see if I can find it. It's uh, it's <laughs> called The uh, Summer Hill: For and Against. I don't know if you've yeah. seen this. Well, I know about Summerhill, obviously. I know about Summerhill. Yeah, no, this this is a fun book. It should be it should be scanned in somewhere. I'll also make a dig up on it. But the um, you know, those of you who uh, haven't um, haven't followed this, Summerhill was an experimental school in the what, 40s and 50s, I think, um, mm -hmm. in Great Britain. Uh, Maybe when we were students. Yeah, earlier than that. But anyway, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, stu the students owned the camera and they drove their learning. It was a very exciting, very exciting project. And, um, in this anthology, you have people who criticized it. And, and I think the only substantial criticism that really sticks with me uh, came from the uh, head of uh, K-12 schools in California. And his argument was that this is all fine, this is good learning, but what happens when we as a society insist that learners have to know a certain thing? 
So maybe it's numeracy, maybe it's citizenship, maybe it's uh, basic reading, whatever it is that we collectively have determined students should learn. And if you remove that imposition, then students, when they want to learn, may miss that. So I mean, you could think of you know, all kinds of examples. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the kid who, the left brain and right brain kids who don't want to learn the other hemisphere of the brain. Or you could think of a, a religious fundamentalist who doesn't want to learn you know, biology or uh, astrophysics. So, you know, or, you know uh, civics is a terribly dull subject that's it's taught most of the time. You know, will we 18-year-olds enter the world with no idea about legislatures and Congress? I have my own response to this, but I'm curious what your response is. What happens if, if we can't get students through the curriculum that we think they should have? I, I think it, the interesting part of that question is the we think they should have part, right? Um, and, um, you know, I, I go back to, uh, you know, Seymour Papert again, who, you know, said, you know, in a world where that we're looking at right now, I mean, what billionth of 1% are you going to choose to teach in schools? Because that's about all you can cover from everything that's knowable these days you know so and, you know he also said something along the lines that, that that's an endless argument that we're never going to solve we're never going to come to some consensus on that i look at current curriculum and um the the fact that so much of it feels like just spray and pray right that we're going to we're going to throw a lot of stuff out there and we're going to hope that some of it sticks but we all know all of us know that most of it is gone almost immediately after the test. And so that then begs the question for me, so at what expense curriculum, right? And I think in the days before the web, before we had access to so much of it, I kind of can get to the argument that said, look, you know, if you're gonna learn algebra, you gotta learn it here in seventh grade with these kids from your neighborhood, with this teacher and this curriculum, going through at this pace and taking this test. Because if you don't go through that, no, you may not get it, right? I get it, may not. But that's not true any longer. That's not true. And so the question about curriculum, I, I'm for much, much less than probably most people are. Um, not all, all, all the way over to Summerhill, but certainly reading, writing, basic skill, basic math skills, certainly an understanding of civics, all those types of things. How do you function in the world as a, as a good human being, as a responsible human being? But I think that most of those things can be taught in the context of other things that kids really love and care about, you know, that those things are not separate subjects necessarily. Certainly you can learn civics in the context of solving a problem with the environment, you know, or, or in writing a book or in, in doing, a, you know, creating a, a dramatical play or whatever, right? So um, I just think that we're we're so wedded to this idea that we have to decide. Um, I, I I get the argument to that to some extent, but I I think it's way too much right now. Again, given given the realities of this moment, when we have so many things we can potentially pursue that will engage us and help us become learners, really deep and powerful learners, uh, because of that engagement, rather than sit idly by in some class listening to someone drone on about a particular topic that we don't care about. And you know what I'm saying? I, it, it's, it's a, it's a complex question right now, but um, I really think that uh, for me, at least it's less, much less now. It's, it's funny. I mean, you say, I know what you're saying. And I find everybody does that um, any time I ask any audience on earth about bad teaching, people have epic, poem cycles of bad teaching. They can all find it really easily. I mean, it's, a, it's remarkable how we, uh, we really expect that. But, but, um, but, you know, let me just say really fast that I don't, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's so much bad teaching as it is just kind of bad systems and bad traditions and, you know, bad, like, expectations under which teachers have to work. I mean, look, my, my son is pretty much disengaged from school. Um, he's uh, highly engaged in basketball. In fact, I'm a nervous wreck. He's got his state quarterfinal game here in about an hour and a half. But um, you know, when his, his teachers are good people and they're good teachers. They care about him and they want what's best for him and they try to make it stimulating, but they are so confined by curriculum, by expectations, by assessments, by evaluations, by all sorts of dysfunctional stuff that we do that it's almost impossible for them 
to um, create conditions in their classrooms where kids are engaged. Um, they, they, they have to work really hard because they, they don't have that freedom and the teachers don't have that agency to you know, allow kids to pursue things that they're interested in. So there's this whole, you know, I, I think that the, what the web is doing and these, these affordances that we have now to learn, it's making the dysfunction of the current system even more acute. And I think that kids are feeling it even more. I think teachers are feeling it even more. And um, I think that's why, as I said earlier, a lot of these conversations now are about, well, how do we really change it? How do we really fundamentally rethink it? Um, because it's not working in this context any longer. Let me uh, step back for a second and get a little bit meta. Uh, first, if uh, Leah uh, has found uh, on the web some of the uh, Stanford documents, and she put a couple of URLs there. Um, so uh, I recommend taking a look at those. That's the uh, D School Reimagined, for example. Very good stuff. Thank you, Leah. Um, uh, second, if you would like to ask a question or share your example of uh, disengagement or engagement with learning, remember the raise hand button and the uh, ask button there on the very bottom. Um, and uh, if you're on Twitter, uh, please feel free to uh, hurl some tweets our way uh, if that's a more convenient place for you to, uh, to be connected. Um, well, I was going to shift ground for a second, um, but uh, I wanted to try something new uh, within Shindig. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, folks here uh, if you could talk with each other for a minute um, about what you are seeing of this problem of student agency and teacher agency. And we've really identified very powerfully this way that students are de agenced in school, and they really don't control their learning and the curriculum. The teacher is going to control their teaching and learning. What have you seen of this, either in your own life, or if you have children of appropriate age, their lives, or what have you seen in your community? Uh, now, by conversing, what I mean is, look down there, look at the other people, grab somebody's icon, so say grab Mark Babbitt or Steve Landry or Leah or Sam, click on their icon, and your two icons will come together, and you can talk out loud. So. Grab that and let's do this for a minute. Share your experience. In fact, you can grab three, four, or even five people to kind of comic strip looking thing. Okay, and we're back. Um, you know, I don't know about you, but I just had a really fun conversation now with Amy, who is uh, not too far from me. Uh, I hope you guys got to have uh, some good example. Um, just, Amy made me reflect on my uh, my youngest, my 17-year-old, and how he learns and how he doesn't learn. Um, how about the rest of you guys? In the chat box, what came to mind as we were answering Will's questions about agency, empowerment, and disempowerment. If you'd rather speak out loud, uh, just click the uh, raise hand button down there in the bottom right, and then we can promote you up to the, up to the stage. So Shelley Alcorn mentions that her recent experience with her own high school absolutely mirrors what we're talking about. Uh, Joe, here. Um, Joe, why don't you come up and uh, Shindy, kick me off the stage. Put Joe in my place, please. So this is actually me reporting to something interesting that Greg said. Um, and it was, <laughs> it was neat for the two of us to have a, a conversation uh, Greg working, I, I think, Greg, you're working in K-12, is that right? Um, certainly we talked about, about our kids uh, and their experiences, and I work in higher ed. But one of the things that Greg pointed out, which I, which I do see both on the K-12 and the higher ed level, is that we're past the point where 
technical competency can be a meaningful goal anymore. Um, that we're we're at a stage where uh, we need to teach learners how to deal with the fact that your favorite service may uh, redesign and start to stink, or may you know get acquired, or die, or just be replaced by something better. Uh, that's the pace of change that we're dealing with. At the same time, we're dealing with the fact that the amount of computing that we've got is not going to go away and probably not going to decrease. It's going to become more common in more places. Um, and this gets into a lot of the problems we've got with the amount of inertia it takes to change a curriculum, which is real. Um, it's a lot of work to uh, rework your course to integrate a new tool. And certainly what I deal with is faculty members who say, I want to do that work if you can't promise me it'll be there next year. And with a lot of the, mo the most innovative tools, I have to say, I can't promise you that. And I think it's something where both, both people who are acknowledged as learners and teachers who are also learners are just going to have to get comfortable with that. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, uh, Sylvia, just really fast, Sylvia Martinez, again, I, I mentioned before, was on a session with me this morning, and she basically said, we have to embrace the chaos. You know, I mean, we have to embrace it because it's not going away. It's, uh, I don't know that it's going to get, well, <laughs> depending on how the presidential campaign ends up, it may get worse. I don't know, <laughs> but it's pretty bad as it is, right? But, you know, we are, we're going to have to embrace it. That's going to be, have to, have to be our mindset. Um, that's, uh, that, that kind of stable picture of the future. Not that it was ever a hundred percent certain, but certainly I think my parents had a better idea of what my life was going to look like. Um, no idea what my kids' lives are going to be like. Um, and uh, we're going to have to embrace that and have the mindset to deal with that. I think. But yeah, thanks for that comment. Thanks, Jake. Big. I can go now and you can pick somebody else. Here you go. Just like that. If this was vaudeville, we'd have a big hook, right? And we'd just like pull them off stage. You know? <laughs> Um, That's what you need, right? Or a little exploding you, something or other, you know? <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I think that's a great point, that we're still building these curricula that are really in, in lockstep. Um, well, let, let, me, let me ask you a question, if I could draw on one of the technologies that we discussed before. Um, you know, you're an early adopter of, um, of social media, in fact, before we called it social media, when we called it Web yep. 2.0. What do you think now in 2016, what do you think are the best affordances of social media for learning? And what do you think are the big dangers of social media for learning? You know, I don't even think we called it Web 2.0 back then. I, don't, <laughs> I think it was like <laughs> even before that. Um, so, you know, I've really become much more, uh, I don't want to say pessimistic, but maybe realistic about social media. I think, uh, I won't speak for you, but I think many of us at the beginning of all this 15, 16 years ago, saw this as a real democratizer, saw this as a real opportunity for people to participate in ways that, and give them voice in ways that maybe they didn't have in the past and that you know the collaborative efforts of engaged people coming together on the web would would create all sorts of interesting movements and really change the world for better and i'm not giving up on that yet but certainly as you look at social media today it is uh it's a, m a much more complex place it's a um, a much uh, more difficult place in a lot of ways um, I think in many ways it, it uh, shines a light on our, the best of who we are, but it also definitely shines a light on the worst of who we are. Um, and and I, I, my, my biggest fear is that the, 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 the kind of downside of the web will scare us away. And I kind of see that happening already. And um, we're becoming more and more appified, you know. We're moving away from the web into these very small, much smaller communities, much more kind of um, you know, same biases, same viewpoints of the world. I think there's that echo chamber effect that is ex becoming more accentuated rather than um, going away. And and I, I think that that's a real concern because, and I, there are a lot of people writing about that now. Dave Weiner is, is writing a lot about, you know, what has happened to the web and um, how, and Audrey Waters writes about this, you know, and you've talked about this, a domain of one's own, you know, how do we, how do we maintain our stuff in, in places so that when the tools go away, we don't lose it? And how do we really engage in conversations that are diverse um, so that we're hearing and, and do that respectfully, 
so that we do that so that we you know, we have a very kind of balanced view of the world I don't know I I think these are huge complex questions when it comes to education um, that uh, require a, a new level of literacy on the part of the adults in the room um, to really uh, help model the types of, of uh, behaviors and the, hype, the, the types of interactions that we want kids to have so that those interactions can be the powerful learning experiences that you know and I know can happen in this environment. You know, right. I mean, I, I still think the web is right. the most powerful learning environment in my lifetime, more here than I have in any of my, hold on one second, sorry about that. I've learned more in these environments than I have in <laughs> Any of yeah, there we go, right? In 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 any school environment that I that I was in. So um, I'm cautiously, hopefully, optimistic that we can kind of go through this kind of dysfunctional, complex period where it is very messy and chaotic, um, and come out the other side with with uh, uh, new tools, perhaps, but new spaces where you know we can we can do powerful things together. Yeah, that's well said. Yeah, that's very well said. And that's also the voice of a long, long period of experience. Uh, we've seen all yeah. these. Um, and I'm, I'm nodding vigorously. Uh, the fear of this becoming amplified, the fear of the echo chamber, the, um, you know, the problem of uh, ed, ed conversations becoming undiverse. Um, I, I've actually personally started using Facebook more than I used to uh, for one reason. This sounds. It sounds really crazy. Um, I'm actually having really good political conversations on Facebook. I, I know this sounds insane, um, but what I've done, I, I have a weird variety of people who know me. I mean, have left, the right, from around the world. I've kind of a Swiss banker, I've anarchists, monarchists, libertarians, uh, hardcore, uh, any kind of faith. And, and it's wonderful to see them argue with each other. And I, Is that I've a managed group I can to. Join? <laughs> It's, yeah, I'm on Facebook. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I, I just ask, you know, teacher questions. I'll ask to provoke discussion. Yeah. And and people who don't like it skip it. Um, but they, right. these conversations roll. And I, I haven't done this on my blog, and I, I don't do as much of that on Twitter in part because I, I try to separate my my explicit political conversations from my professional life, which I'm not sure if I want to change that or not. It's going to depend. I mean, if we have President Trump, it, I might not have a choice. Um, but it's one of the things that strikes me is how people say how weird it is to have these experiences, you know, to have the uh, uh, social conservative arguing with a uh, social democrat. And they, that's cool. And they, and they're, they're fairly polite, and they say, This is weird. You know, they wouldn't have this conversation. All right. Well, uh, let me just zero in on one thing you, one of the many good things you said, which is that we have to, as adults, model these kind of behaviors for, for our kids. Um, I think we need to be braver about comments, about leaving comments and about making them. Uh, I was just talking to Amy um, here in Vermont, and one problem I have in Vermont is people don't like to use social media. They don't like to contribute to it. Uh, so I think we have to model that, of going on web pages and leaving comments. We have to you know, at more people on, on Twitter. We have to produce more blogger. Um, my friend Alan Levine, and you know Alan very well, is always says sure. we have to make more art. You know, I agree. We can put it through social media, just so people can uh, we can model this, so the kids don't don't, don't turn away. Well, let me, let me ask: If you were giving advice to a uh, president of a college, or a provost of a university, or the trustees for a state institution, you know, like, like California State University, or the uh, or the incredibly stressed uh, schools in uh, Louisiana or Illinois. How would you recommend that they approach social media? Would you tell them to uh, incorporate more of it in classes? Would you tell them to behave like public intellectuals? How would you advise them? Well, I think I would try to make the argument that social media is an essential tool for learning these days. Um, as complex as it is, I mean, I, I make this point all the time. I, I can't, if I was to think about my kids have without the opportunity to use social media and, and web, you know, technologies to learn compared to, or being able to compete with kids who were able to do that. I, I don't, I don't know how they would do it. Um, I, I don't, I, I think it's just a, a fundamental piece of, of our, of our work, of our learning. 
And um, I think that uh, uh, the first step to doing that is to make, and, and you know, and obviously in institutions, in higher education institutions, it's more difficult, I think, than in K through 12 institutions, but just because of their size. But, you know, if you're going to create a learning culture, um, social media has to be a part of that. And I think it has to be an expectation. As you said, it has to be modeled. It has to, we have to participate in order to be able to help our kids participate well and um, to, uh, to, you know, do good work. And I, I think that kind of getting back to the K through 12 conversation, I think that's one of the biggest problems that we have right now. And again, no disrespect to the teachers who are in the classrooms, but the vast majority of them don't participate. They don't see the web as a learning tool. They're not engaged in learning communities. They don't see, as Harold Jarkey says, you know, that learning is the work and that we can, um, they're not learners in that, in that context again. And that's a really, to me, it's a big culture shift that we need to, uh, again, embrace in some ways.